What's happening, fam? It's the Dr. Chris Harper Show. Hey, do you know we have a newsletter? You can stay in the know. All the happenings with the show, future episodes, exciting releases, all the stuff you want to know. Check it out in the notes of the show. Click the link, like it, subscribe. If you know, then you know. All right, fam, I'm doing a little bit of a one-off episode this week because I want to talk about everybody's favorite topic, the Olympics, specifically the opening ceremony. Now, I know people are going back and forth on this. I know it's a hot topic, but the reality is uh, towards the end of the opening ceremony, there was a depiction of Da Vinci's Last Supper, and it was um, depicted, it depicted the apostles, it depicted King Jesus basically using um, homosexuals, transgendered people, etc. Right? And it, and it wasn't freedom of expression. Um, it wasn't artistic license. Uh, it was a direct assault and a direct attack on Christianity. Period. I know there's lots of arguments around this. Not really concerning myself much with that. This was an attack on uh, on Scripture, on on the Word of God, the character of God, who God is. And it's interesting. I want you to notice uh, Jesus Christ was the one attacked. Uh, Muhammad was not attacked. The Buddha was not attacked. The Dalai Lama was not attacked. Why? It's because Islam. And these other false religions are products of the world. They were created by the world's system. Christianity is the only religion that is otherworldly. Christianity is not of this world, but it is in the world for the redemption of the world. You see, Muhammad and the Buddha and the Dalai Lama, they don't pose any real threat to the world because they're of the world. The only person, the only religious system that poses a threat to the prince and principalities of this world is King Jesus. It's Christianity because it's the the, the one true religion. It is the one that is pushing back against the spiritual darkness and the evil forces of darkness. So it's no wonder that that King Jesus is being mocked and even bullied and sneered at, right? He's the only one that really poses a threat to the ways of this world. And Scripture tells us anyways, like, those people in the darkness, they hate the light. They hate the light. It's right there in the Gospel of John. Why? Because the light exposes their dark deeds, so they hate the light. But, but what's more interesting, right? So, so put aside the religious agenda for a moment. I want you to think about just the culture and the context, not just surrounding France, but, but all of Europe. And this is, this is super important for us in the West. I'm a, I'm a big historian. Um, I was a political science major in college, not sure what I was going to do with that. Um, it's, it's one of the most useless degrees. Uh, no, no, uh, no insult if you're a poli sci major. Uh, but I love kind of systems and, and schemes and, and things of the world. So, so I want you to think about Europe. I want you to think about France for a moment. You know, our entire country here in the West, North America, it's, it's, it's kind of riddled with European and, and French philosophy, Right. I mean, even the founding of our country has French blood spilled on it. I mean, Lafayette uh, was, a, was a general in the Continental Army. You know, a lot of our founding fathers spent significant time in France learning ideologies and philosophies and systems. Uh, the concept of a republic, uh, the concept of, of democracy, we actually, we actually gleaned from the French. And it's almost like, like France and the rest of Europe is kind of big brother and and we're little brother and we're we're sitting at the feet of big brother just begging him to let us come along. And this is huge. Uh, France doesn't just influence us through perfume and food and handbags. No, no. French thought and and really European thought 
influences our philosophies. It influences our, 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 our morals. Um, it influences our religiosity in this world, uh, in the West. So, so I was sharing this with a, with a group of men recently, and I said, you know, if you want to know where America's morals and America's convictions are going to be 20, 30, 40 years from now, all you got to do is look across the pond. All you got to do is look to Europe, look to France, and you can basically see where we're going to be uh, concerning our moral and religious convictions. Uh, in, a, in a recent poll, uh, it just showed that, that people in France, um, less than 11% of the people in France think uh, religion plays any significant or important role in someone's life. Less than 11%. Less than 12% actually attend a religious service uh, consistently or at all. You know, 70, 80% approve of, of homosexual relationships. Almost 60% of people in France think that, that adultery and sex outside of marriage is okay. They actually prescribe it. 90% are okay with with abortion really at, at, at any level. And if you want to know where like the values and the morals of, of us in the West, if you want to know where it's headed, all you got to do is look to Europe. All you got to do is look to France. We are 20, 30, 40 years behind. So I'm kind of sharing this uh, a political thought with a group of people, and a guy says, well, Chris, if, if all that's true, um, then what are we supposed to do? And as I began looking for the answer, uh, my pastor who was there, there with me, uh, he kind of bailed me out. He said, well, that's easy. We're going to make disciples who make disciples. That's what we're going to do. And, and I immediately was, was convicted. I'm, I'm painting this kind of you know, sad state of, of America, this sad state of, of, of religion and, and where we're headed. And, and I forgot that, man, King Jesus, like, is in charge. As a matter of fact, the reason he's being belittled and the reason he's being mocked and the reason they're trying to bully him is because he's the king of kings. And, like, he can't be stopped. They can't defeat him. Like, his church will go on forever. His church survived Herod and Pharaoh, and Xerxes. His church has survived every scheme and every conflict and every trap the devil has set. His church has survived Satan himself. France and the Olympics are not going to stop King Jesus. So everybody just needs to relax. Everybody needs to calm down. Um. I'm kind of proud in a weird way that Jesus was mocked. They're mocking him and they're belittling him because they fear him. Because they know they can't stop him. They know they can't beat him. They're not mocking Muhammad because Muhammad can't do anything. As a matter of fact, if you go visit the grave of Muhammad, guess what? He's still there. They're not mocking the Buddha because Buddha can't do anything. If you go visit the grave of the last Buddha, guess what? He's still there. But go visit the grave of Jesus, visit the tomb, and it's empty. Even death couldn't stop him. So of course he's going to be mocked. Of course he's going to be ridiculed. Of course he's going to be belittled. And they're afraid of him. And they should be. They also should be afraid of people like you and of people like me. Any, any man that takes his, his, his religion seriously, that takes Christianity seriously, man, you cannot be ignored. I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones said about the Beatitudes. He said, he said any Christian that, that really lives out the Beatitudes, man, they can't be ignored. Like you have to contend with them. And that's how I want us to live. That's how I want to live. Man, if I'm going to be on someone's hit list, if I'm going to be on someone's target, man, I want it to be hell's hit list. I want the devil to know my name. I love that, that story in, in Acts when, 
when Paul comes to the Ephesian church, right, and he casts out a demon and, and some sons of a, of a Jewish priest, the seven sons of Sceva, they see Paul doing it and they say, we want to do that. They go looking for a demon-possessed man and they find one. And they go to the demon-possessed man and they say, um, excuse us, but in the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims, come out. And I love what the demon says. The demon says, uh, Jesus we know, and Paul we've heard of, but who are you? And then the Bible says the demon leaps on them and wounds them to they flee the house wounded and naked. Like the devil literally beat the pants off of them. They left the house wounded and naked. But, but I think it's, it's powerful what the demon said. The demon said, Jesus we know and Paul we've heard of. I love that when demons get together, when the spiritual forces of darkness get together in the break room, they talk about Paul. Like they know Paul's name. Why do they know his name? Because they're afraid of Paul. Man, I want demons to know your name, and I want demons to know my name. My fear is Satan, the demonic, they don't know enough of us. They're not afraid of you, and they're not afraid of me, and they're not afraid of our churches, which is why we just kind of meander through the world, and the world ignores us because the world doesn't see us as a problem. Whoever orchestrated the opening of the Olympics, whatever officials did that, whatever, whatever French men or women were in charge of that, they see Jesus as a problem, which is why he was mocked. It's why he was belittled. It's why they're trying to bully him. But guess what? He can't be bullied. He can't lose. As men, I want us to be a problem. I want us to be good trouble. I want, I want people, I want the demonic to know our names. So how do we do that? Well, my pastor was right. We make disciples who make disciples. Man, we forget that, that Christianity is not hereditary, right? You're not born a Christian. God is always winning people to his church. He's always um, humbling the exalted and exalting the humble. He's always taking the least of these, the marginalized, the person you would not expect, and turning them for his glory. People like the Apostle Paul, people like Peter, Zacchaeus, Matthew, you name it. The reality is the next Billy Graham is probably drunk in a frat house right now. The next Mother Teresa is probably at an abortion clinic right now. The person that's probably going to disciple your grandkids just flipped you off on the highway as they drove by you with their coexist bumper sticker. Man, God is always taking murderers and thieves and whores, and lesbians, and whoever else, and he's making them the cornerstones of his new city. His church cannot be stopped. And we just got to remember that. And we've got to be faithful with what he's called us to do, which is what? Make disciples who make disciples. And this, this disciple-making process is always a slow and arduous process. It's always one generation reaching down into another generation and showing them the way of King Jesus. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's what's missing from the West today. It's what's missing from most of our churches is this disciple-making culture, this disciple-making urgency. We don't have it. We don't see it anymore. As a matter of fact, the majority of professing Christians have never been discipled, nor are they actively discipling anyone right now. Like those watching this show, man, who are you discipling right now? How are you discipling them? You've got to ask and answer that question. Because if we're going to push back against the, the demonic and the, the forces of darkness in this world, we're going to do it through the slow, arduous process of discipleship, training up and raising up followers of the king. That's how God designed it. And that's what he wants to use you for. 
Like that's our purpose in this world, whether it's our spouses, whether it's our children, whether it's a neighbor, we are to be pointing them to the king. We are to be ushering them into the presence of the king, and we are to be sending them out on behalf of the king, making disciples who make disciples. That's what we're called to do. That's how we'll push back against the Olympic message. That's how we'll push back against the cultural drift. That's how we'll push back against Satan's schemes, against his, his lies, his deception. That's how you'll get your, your name on hell's hit list. Man, I want the demons to know your name, and I want them to know my name. we got to make disciples who make disciples. So first step, man, are you being discipled right now? Who in your life is pouring into your life, is offering you correction, even rebuke, is offering you encouragement, is offering you wisdom, helping you look and become more like Jesus? And, and, and let me tell you, it's probably not anyone in your peer group in the 80s, we had this big shift in the church where we, we left academic spaces, think Sunday school, and we moved into communal spaces, think, think life groups, and we basically segregated everybody in the church by age and stage. We even have age and stage pastors today. So we put all the singles over here and all the marrieds over here. If you got young kids, you can go over here. If you're 20, you can go over here. If you're 60, you go over there. And we thought by, by putting all the 20-year-olds together, wisdom and experience would just bloom. It doesn't happen like that. When we segregated everybody by age and stage, we basically killed multi-generational discipleship. And listen, I've seen young people lead up. It can happen. But more times than not, experience and wisdom is transferred down through the generations. And when you kill generational discipleship, when you kill multi-generational discipleship, you have a Judges 2 problem. You have, you have one generation dying and another generation coming to power who did not know God nor the things God had done. So what? They did what was right in their own eyes. We have generations, especially generations of young men right now, doing what was right in their own eyes because the knowledge of God and the goodness of God and the stories about God were not transferred down. And the church is largely to blame for this. Most men today, when I meet them and ask about their discipleship experience, they're in a small group with their wife. That's their experience. That's not discipleship. That's typically peer-to-peer -peer encouragement. As a matter of fact, I think women should be discipling women and men should be discipling men. Not only is it multi-generational discipleship, it is gender-based discipleship. I believe that's what the Bible best teaches gender-based, multi-generational discipleship. So, so, brother, what older man, and listen, age is relative. If you're 18, 24 is old. If you're 24, 35 is old. If you're 35, 50 is old. And if you're 70, you're just old. You've got everybody covered. But, but, but brother, what older man, whether he's a step ahead of you or three steps ahead of you, is pouring into your life right now, showing you the things of God? teaching you to follow and obey God, sharing with you the stories of God. And maybe it's not one older man. Maybe it's a group of men. Maybe it's your church. I've met men who have been discipled by their church. That's amazing. But who is it right now? And if you can't rattle off that name, then you're probably not being discipled. I can rattle off Bill and Jeff. I can rattle off the names of the men that have, that are discipling me right now. And then the next question is just as important. That information that you're learning, that training that you're receiving, that, that godliness and the stories of God and his goodness that are being passed on to you, who are you passing on to others? Who are the others? Who are the younger men in your life right now that you're training in godliness, that you're saying, hey, follow me because I know the way. I know the way. And again, if you can't name those people, if one or two names aren't, aren't rattling off the tip of your tongue, it's likely you're not discipling anybody. And I'm not talking about 
these people in your peer group. I'm not talking about these people in your small group study with your wife. I'm talking about the younger men you are intentionally pouring into, the younger men that look more like Jesus because of you. We have got to get back to that, that 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. Paul looks at Timothy, and he says, Timothy, what I've learned I've taught you, you now teach faithful men who will teach others four generations of discipleship in one verse. We've got to get back to that. Man, we can get upset about the Olympic opening ceremony. I've seen so many guys this week boycott the Olympics, boycott the Olympics. That's ridiculous. Bro, I watched our gymnastic team win gold. I see you, Biles. You go, girl. I'm with it. I've watched our swim team. I'm watching our basketball team dominate. I can't wait for track and field. I love the Olympics. I hate that my king was mocked, but I know this, he won't be mocked forever. Like he will get the last laugh because he can't be stopped. But until he returns, it's up to us to take ground on his behalf. And we do that by making disciples who make disciples. So don't post anything. Don't put anything on X. Don't complain about anything if you're not willing to do the work to push back against the darkness. You can't complain and sit in the dark if you're not willing to turn on a light. It's ridiculous. Who's discipling you? And then who are you discipling? You want to make a difference? Make disciples who make disciples.